this evening we're uh, looking at, um, well, the uh, teaching of Scripture that God is in absolute control of all things. And that includes absolutely everything. I want us to see that from Isaiah 46. Um, I think what I'd like to do is begin reading in verse 3, if that's um, a possibility. Folks upstairs. And uh, I'd like to read through verse 10. Isaiah 46, beginning in verse 3. Would you please listen carefully to this? This is not the word of any man. This is the word of God. Isaiah writes to the inspiration of the Spirit, again recording what the Lord would have him to say. He says, listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnants of the house of Israel, you who have been born by me from birth and have been carried from the womb, even to your old age, I shall be the same. And even to your graying years, I shall bear you. I have done it, and I shall carry you, and I shall bear you, and I shall deliver you. To whom would you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we should be alike? Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh silver on the scale hire a goldsmith, and he makes it into a god. They bow down, indeed, they worship it. They lift it upon the shoulder and carry it. They set it in its place and it stands there. It does not move from its place. Though one may cry to it, it cannot answer. It cannot deliver him from his distress. Remember this and be assured. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things long past. For I am God and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. May the Lord bless his word to our uh, hearing this evening. Now, again, as you know, we're going through a series that uh, seeks to help us understand where it is we may differ from others in, in different areas of their understanding of Scripture, uh, sometimes from, um, well, from unbelievers, sometimes from other believers. And the, the situation this evening is perhaps, um, <clears throat> I think we have to say that perhaps we disagree, in this case, from those who are unbelievers, because to deny the sovereignty of God and to deny His, his foreknowledge to deny the fact that he is in control of all things is really to deny that God is God. I mean, that is what he is. He even you know, explains it to us this evening in our text quite plainly. Now, again, we do disagree. There's a disagreement even within the church with regard to the control that God actually has. Whether or not he's in control of the events of the world, whether or not he really understands or knows what's going to happen in the future and is in control. Now we've already looked at perhaps the area where within the church there is the greatest disagreement, and that has to do with whether or not God is sovereign with regard to our salvation. There are those who believe that election basically means that God chooses everyone and then leaves it up to them whether they're going to choose Him, whereas we've already seen that we believe that nobody would choose God apart from His grace. And so God must first choose them if anyone is going to choose him at all. But there are those that go even further to say that God isn't sovereign really in anything. Now, I believe that this concern rises from a desire in, in, the, in, well, in the minds of those that uh, call themselves perhaps Arminians, or maybe we call them Arminians, uh, to preserve free will in man. And their argument goes something like this. If God knows what someone is going to do in the future, if he foresees and foreknows any actions, then his knowing that decision or that action makes it absolutely certain to take place. And if it is certain to take place, in their understanding, it can't be a free decision. We're going to look a little bit more at that this evening to understand that, but to 
to avoid this uh, eventuality in their minds. They believe that God cannot really have absolute knowledge of the future. He cannot be sovereign. They deny these things. Well, this evening we're going to see that God is, in fact, in control. That this is one of the things that actually distinguishes God from the false gods of the world. As a matter of fact, he just mentioned that regarding himself as he distinguishes himself from idols. Idols made of gold that can't move from their place. When you cry out to them, they can't do anything. But unlike them, the true God is able to declare the end from the beginning. He is able to reveal, even from ancient times, the things that have not yet taken place. He is able to do this, not just because he knows what's going to happen, but because, as we're going to see, he has actually planned it. And he is determined to bring to pass everything that he has planned. Now, tonight I want us to consider three things. First of all, that God knows all things. He knows the end from the beginning. God is omniscient. Secondly, that he knows them because he planned them. We call this the decree of God, his absolute sovereignty. And then thirdly, that he is working, well, because he knows all things and has planned all things, that he has actually planned all these things to work them all together to accomplish his holy will. And thankfully, his will is for the good of his church and of his people. So first of all, let's consider that God knows all things. You know, years ago, actually, it was Jonathan Edwards who created this, this problem in a certain sense because his argumentation against Arminianism was so powerful that it still reverberates throughout the years. Years ago, Jonathan Edwards wrote in his Freedom of the Will an argument against the Arminian idea of free will. And again, arguing what we've already seen is the reason why we have some today arguing the foreknowledge of God. He said this, that if God had only the foreknowledge of events, if he only knew what was going to happen, if he could see those actions taking place, that would be enough to prove the fact that he is absolutely sovereign in all things, including salvation. Now, if God looks ahead and he sees that something is going to take place, then one thing must be true. That event must take place. And there is nothing that could possibly stop it. Because if something could stop it and that event might not take place, then God could not know that it was going to take place. I hope you can see that, that that's true. If he sees it's going to happen, it has to happen. He wouldn't be able to foresee something in his future unless that thing were actually going to take place. So what God foreknows, what God foresees, will come to pass. But if he foreknows that something is going to take place and he doesn't do anything to stop it, which, of course, he wouldn't do anything to stop it, otherwise he couldn't foreknow it's going to take place. I hope you see that, that point, too. Then, basically, God is approving that that thing take place. If he foresees it's going to happen, it's going to take place. If it's going to take place, that means he's also determining not to do anything to stop it. That means that he is sovereignly ordaining that that event is going to take place. Now, that means that he must approve of everything he foresees. Otherwise, he wouldn't foresee it. It wouldn't take place. It would be otherwise. He wouldn't allow it to take place. But if God approves of everything that he sees is going to happen, which he has to, otherwise he would not foresee it, then he, Edwards argues that's the same thing as absolute sovereignty. God is in absolute control. He is in abs he's absolutely sovereign over what's going to take place and what isn't going to take place. Even the fact that he foresees it is enough to prove that God is sovereign. Now, the Arminians of his day didn't like that. They didn't like Edward's reasoning. They wanted to believe, and this was the problem, that no decision, if it's to be absolutely free, could be something that is absolutely certain to take place. That in order for man to have freedom, he must be free at all times to choose either good or evil uh, without anything, basically, you know, uh, 
even influencing him to make that decision. If something is certain to take place in any sense, then that destroys man's freedom. Now, they did know as well that at least at some level that what Edwards was saying was true. If God knows the future, then the decisions of men are absolutely certain. And they also knew that they could not deny the fact that God foreknew everything, which is what, you know, is, is the force of this argument, without denying God. Because God, by definition, must know absolutely everything that comes to pass. So they were sort of at an impasse. You know, what happens when, when something like that goes on, you just ignore the argument because you can't answer it. But Edward's argumentation was absolutely devastating to the Arminians who did not want to believe that man's decisions were, were foreknown and yet could not deny the foreknowledge of God without denying God. Well, as the years went by, of course, as you know, things change. A movement developed that wasn't afraid to deny God's foreknowledge for the sake of human freedom. That movement is called open theism. Perhaps you've heard of it, the idea that God isn't sovereign, the fact that God doesn't even know what the future is. Here's a couple of definitions of open theism. Open theism, also called free will theism and openness theology, is the belief that God does not exercise meticulous control of the universe, but leaves it open for humans to make significant choices, free will that impact their relationships with God and others. A corollary of this is that God has not predetermined the future. Open theists further believe that this would imply that God does not know the future, at least exhaustively. Proponents affirm that God is omniscient, but deny that this means that God knows everything that will happen. That's a contradiction in terms. Omniscience means to know all things. They say he knows all things, but he doesn't know all things. Here's another definition of open theism. Open theism is concerned with how God experiences the world. It asks and attempts to answer the questions, what does God know? And when does he know it? The essence of the questions open theists asks are not dealing with how God knows the future, but if. He knows it at all. An early proponent of open theism said, quote, God experienced the events of the world he has created as they happen rather than all at once in some timeless eternal perception. This also means that not even God knows the future in all its details. Open theists maintain that God does not know what a given human being will do until he acts. They refer to such human actions as possibilities. Because God remains unaware of human possibilities, the future remains open in his mind. This means that rather than God knowing all things, he is in the process of learning new things as they take place. Now, I hope you understand that to believe something like this is to deny what God clearly says regarding himself in the Bible, either that or, believe, or to believe that, that God has said things about himself that are absolutely untrue. In other words, that he's trying to deceive us. Again, listen to what the Lord says through Isaiah the prophet. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done. Now, the only way you can declare the end from the beginning and reveal things long before they take place is if you know all things are going to happen, or at least the things that are going to happen before they happen. God knows all things. Isaiah writes in Isaiah 40, verse 28, that God's understanding is inscrutable. In other words, it is past finding out. David, in expressing uh, just his wonder at the knowledge of God, says this in Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. 
You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways, even before there is a word on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Now, contrast what David just said with what the open theist is saying is that God is learning as decisions are being made, as, as uh, people are doing things. God is seeing and he is learning because he doesn't know. David says here, even before there is a word on my tongue, even before I speak, Lord, you know it all. You know all things. The psalmist in Psalm 147, verse 5, sums it up this way by saying, Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. God knows all things. He knows what's going to take place. Of course, he knows what's already taken place. There's no debate about that. But the Lord also tells us in Scripture that he knows what would take place under any given set of circumstances, even though those things actually don't take place. There was an instance where David and his men were held up in the city of Keilah, and that's when Saul was chasing after him. And he heard that Saul and his men were coming after him, and so he calls out to the Lord and asks the Lord, if I stay here, will the men of Keilah hand me over to Saul? And the Lord says, yes, they will. And so David and his men take off, and they never have the opportunity to hand them over same thing happens when uh, Paul was on the way to Rome and they were in the middle of that storm and the Lord tells Paul, unless everybody stays in the ship, no one will be saved. So if anybody goes overboard, if anyone tries to get off, you're all going to be lost. But if everybody stays on board, then you will be saved. The Lord not only knows what will actually happen, but he also knows what could happen under any given set of circumstances. God's Knowledge is infinite, which means there is nothing that he could possibly learn because he knows it all. And that's what you should expect from someone who is infinite. So God knows the future as well as he knows the past. He knows the present. He knows what could happen under any given set of circumstances. His knowledge is without limits. Now, this brings us to the second point. When we ask the question, how does God know all these things? Does God actually have to look ahead to see what's going to take place before he knows it's going to happen? Now, Edwards did use that argument to disprove uh, the idea of um, uh, this idea that the Arminians had of the freedom of the will. And by the way, those Arminians were a little bit different than the Arminians today. These Arminians believe that nothing could possibly influence your decision if it is to be absolutely free, so there couldn't be anything set in stone. Nothing could be determined. Well, Edwards, again, of course, argued against that, and he, he did it on the basis of their, own, of their own belief that God can foresee. They didn't believe he determined, just that he could foresee. Well, the question is, how does God know what's going to take place? Does God actually look ahead? to see what's going to take place? Does he need to look ahead to know what's going to happen? Well, no, he doesn't. Because God already knows, for one thing. God has infinite knowledge. He doesn't have to look ahead. He knows what's going to happen. But the main reason why God knows what's going to happen is because he knows what he has planned to do. God has a plan. I want you to notice our text again because the Lord says as much there. He is the one who declares the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish my good pleasure. Now, what is the Lord talking about here? His purpose, his good pleasure. He's talking about the things that he wanted to take place in this world from all eternity. He is talking about his plan. Now, the Bible says that things don't happen by accident. There is no such thing as accident. There is no such thing as luck. There is no such thing as chance. 
everything happens according to God's plan. Now, after speaking, uh, Paul, after speaking about God's choosing and electing, by the way, you'd have to think back to when we were looking at the doctrine of election. After speaking about God's choosing and electing some and predestining them to become conformed to the image of his son, he writes this. Also, this is Ephesians 1.11. Also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. You see, all of this is a part of God's plan, and God's plan, Paul tells us, is or includes all things. God works all things after the counsel of his will. His purpose is comprehensive. It is infinite, as infinite as, as his knowledge. It includes absolutely everything. You know, Nebuchadnezzar, by the way, this, his plan, his knowledge includes everything because his plan includes everything. Everything that happens in this world happens because that's what God wants to happen. Now, the same thing then is true with regard to the events of the world as it is with regard to our salvation, as we saw this morning, because it's purely of God, purely of his sovereignty, purely of his grace, and we actually could do nothing to get him to save us. We could do nothing to save ourselves. He is the one who gets all the glory for everything good that happens in the world. Now, there was an instance in the Old Testament where a great king of a foreign power, which actually ruled the world, one day was walking on the wall of a great city that he had built called Babylon. His name was King Nebuchadnezzar. And he began to think about uh, all the great accomplishments that he had actually was able to, to do in life, saying, is this not great Babylon, which I have built by my might and for the glory of my power and so forth? And at that particular point, God decided to teach him a lesson that it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar that built that empire, but it was the Lord. So the Lord took away his reason for a period of time, during which time we know that Nebuchadnezzar lived like the animals in the wild. And at the end of this, of this humiliation, the Lord gave him back his reason. And when he did, Nebuchadnezzar knew who it was that really built Babylon and who was responsible for all these things. It wasn't him. It was the Lord. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar has to say. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are, as counted, are accounted as nothing. But he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, What have you done? At that time my reason returned to me, and my majesty and splendor were restored to me. For the glory of my kingdom and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out, so I was reestablished in my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Basically, the point is nothing happens by accident. Not even the bad things that come into our lives or that happen in the world happen by accident. Everything is a part of God's purpose that he is working out for his good pleasure. It's all a part of his sovereign plan. So far from not knowing everything, God actually knows everything that's going to take place, everything that could take place, and he knows it because he's the one who actually planned it, and he's the one who's bringing it about. So this brings us to the final point. Granted that God knows all these things because he planned them, let's think about why he has done it. Well, first of all, let's remember whose plan this is. It is God's plan. 
So what could God's purpose be? What would it be his good pleasure actually to do? Well, whatever it is, we know it must be good. We know it must be right. We know it must be just because that is what God is. He has to do everything perfectly. So why has God planned everything that he has planned? Well, first of all, we know the scripture tells us that God has planned what he has planned for his glory. There could be no higher end in, in existence than the glory of God. This is the reason that God made the world. God didn't make the world and the people in the world primarily for the good of mankind. If we think that way, we won't be able to understand why God does what he does. He did these things for his glory. I mean, think about how Paul in the book of Romans uh, is, is reasoning as he reaches that point that we were looking at in our meditation. God is dealing with Israel in such a way that there's a partial hardening to Israel so that they might reject uh, the Lord Jesus Christ so that in their rejection God might turn to the, uh, the Gentiles. And Paul, looking at the plan of God, says that God has shut all men up in disobedience in order that he might show mercy to all. And he thinks about all this planning and everything that goes into what God has done. And he praises him for his infinite wisdom because what God has done in the end is to bring great glory to himself in the redemption of both Jews and Gentiles. He says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. Basically, Paul is reminding us that God has created all that he has created and done all that he has done in order to display his wisdom, his knowledge, and his glory. God has actually, as again, if I can draw from Jonathan Edwards, has so planned everything that he has planned to reveal absolutely everything about himself. We'll never know the depths of, of God's attributes. We won't know everything about him, but we will see the breadth of it. And you do know that if the Lord had not planned a fall, if he had not uh, planned a redemption, that there are things about the Lord we would never have seen. God has done what he has done in order to show us what he is like. It was his plan from the very beginning. Now, thankfully, there is one thing that God has determined to do to glorify himself, as we've just seen. And actually, we saw this uh, this morning as well. In his infinite grace and mercy, he has planned to provide a free and full salvation to those who could do nothing to save themselves in order to glorify something about himself that we benefit from. And that is God's infinite love and his grace and his mercy. Uh, God planned to reveal something of his justice, something of uh, retribution in the fall of mankind. But he has also planned to uh, reveal his grace and mercy to us in redemption. You know, I feel like I need to do, I do need to say something about this because we do need to recognize God's plan in planning all of these things together does not mean, and, and this is the area that the Arminians are wanting to protect, it doesn't mean that God is, is forcing people to do things against their will. It doesn't mean that God creates evil. It doesn't mean that he made Adam eat of that forbidden fruit. But it does mean that God planned to use these actions that they all freely chose in order to glorify his name. So we do need to understand that God's plan does not force a person to do anything against their will. In God's plan, everyone is always free to choose what they want in any given circumstance. And they always do choose freely. Even Judas chose to deny his Lord and to sell him out for those pieces of silver. 
God did not force him to do it, and yet it was absolutely certain it was going to take place. How the Lord is able to do that, we don't fully understand, but we do know that it's true. Otherwise, God could not hold us accountable for the sins we commit if he's forcing us to do these things. So we realize that God did plan that there would be a fall and that man would fall into sin. And in doing so, God would reveal his, his justice and his retribution, as we're going to see someday. But it also gives him the opportunity to reveal his grace and his mercy, which we saw this morning. Salvation, as we saw, is entirely of grace, entirely a free gift given to those who do not deserve it, given to those who deserve hell. And that shows us, again, the, just the, the infinite wisdom of God as well as his infinite love, grace, and mercy. Now, the Lord has not only determined to reveal his love and his mercy in that way by bringing us to heaven, those who deserve hell, but he has also determined that he will make all things that happen between the time that, well, actually the time we come into the world, and the time we leave this world, he is going to make all those things conspire together or work together for your good. Paul writes in Romans 8.28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God is the one who is causing all these things to take place. And notice he doesn't do that for everyone in the world. He does it for those who love him. And those who love him are those, of course, who are trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, those whom God has had mercy upon. That is the evidence that a person is saved, is that he has that love for God. So he quickly distinguishes who it is that he is doing this for. It is for those who love him. Now, if God did not know all things, he would not be able to do that. If God had not planned all things, he wouldn't be able to do this. If he wasn't in absolute sovereign control of all things, he could not guarantee this that everything would work together for our good. But God does know all things. He has planned all things. He is in control of all things with his infinite power. The Bible says that our Lord Jesus Christ is, is bearing up all things and moving all things along according to God's plan. The Lord even uses the evil that he allows in his creation for good purposes, not just to glorify his, his majesty and his justice, as we've seen, as well as his grace, but to glorify himself in other ways. For instance, Joseph's brothers hated Joseph. They wanted to kill him. They threw him into a pit. They were going to kill him. They decided to sell him into slavery instead. So there was this evil act on the part of the brothers, first of all, wanting to kill him and then sell him into slavery. And yet the Bible tells us that God actually used that evil to bring about good purposes. At the very end of the day, Joseph says to them, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God what, meant what for good? The evil actions that the brothers committed. God, in his plan, used that evil to bring about good purposes. As a matter of fact, the greatest crime that's ever been committed in history, God has used that to bring about a great end. He's the one who planned that Jesus Christ would be crucified by his own people. But the purpose behind it was that he might save a multitude, which no man can number. He was put to death at the hands of wicked men in order to save mankind. I mean, the Lord even uses natural evils that occur in this world, such as the earthquakes and the tornadoes and the volcanoes and even disease to bring about his purposes. God didn't create those things. They're a part of the curse uh, as on all man, well, actually on all mankind and all creation. But God uses these things for his glory. Now, God knows all things. God has planned all things. God is in control of all things. And God is using all things for his glory and for the good of his church. Now, what does that mean for you personally? Well, because this is true, Everything that comes into your life 
comes into your life as a part of that plan. Nothing happens by accident, nothing at all. God is absolutely sovereign in everything because it's a part of his plan. Now, the Bible says, as we've just read, that if you're trusting the Lord and if you love the Lord, then you can know that whatever it is that's happened to you, whatever it is that is happening to you, whatever it is that will happen to you, God is going to work together for your good. Even the things that we look back into our history and we say, yuck, I wish I had never done that. The Lord is using that in the present for some good purpose in your life either to help somebody else going through the same situation or just to humble you, to show you that, yes, you are a sinner, you're not perfect, to show you your need of his grace. There's a myriad of ways God can use even the bad things that you did in your life, even your sins, even your sins presently, the things, the trials you're going through, the difficulties you're having to face. God has allowed them for a purpose, and if you love him, it is a good purpose. And you may not know what that good purpose is now, but you do know that you will one day see what that good purpose is. God's ends are always good ends. Because the Lord is in control, you, can, you also know that he's going to be able to do for you what is most important. And that is he is going to be able to bring you to heaven and nothing can stop him. I mean, do you think God foreknows and foresees who is in heaven? Certainly. Why does he know that? Because he knows all things. Why does he know all things? Because he has planned all things. And if he has planned to bring you to heaven, which is evidenced by your love and trust in him right now, you can know that God will bring you to heaven. He will complete your salvation. And again, even the sins that you have to wrestle with, even now in your lives are all a part of his plan to prepare you and bring you eventually to heaven. What Paul said to the Philippian church is equally true of you. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Uh, because God is absolutely sovereign because he has omnipotent power. There is nothing in heaven or earth that can stop him. That's why he knows what's going to happen. Nothing can thwart his plan. Paul reminds us in Romans 8, 38 and 39, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If this is what God has purposed for you, then you do not need to worry about anything because God is in sovereign control of all things and he is going to be able to bring about what he has purposed. God can guarantee it. And so far from looking at God's foreknowledge and his decree, his sovereignty and power and so forth as being a threat to us so that we have to redefine God to eliminate the things that, um, you know, the, these things that, well, that the Arminians object to and the open theists object to. These are the things about God that actually guarantee to us that his purposes will be established and his good pleasure will be accomplished. God will work all things together for good, both for his glory in this world, and thankfully all the things that we see going on in the world, we read the newspaper from day to day that we hate because it's all evil. This person kills this person, this person violates this person, or whatever it is. One day the Lord is going to deal with all those things. He's going to make things right, the fact that he knows the fact that he has planned, the fact that he has all power to do his holy will. He will bring it about. And it also guarantees that he will bring us home in his time and give us to his son as he promised. And we will be able to enjoy heaven forever. So the foreknowledge of God, the decree of God, the sovereignty of God is not our enemy 
it is our guarantee of life and that we will see heaven. If God is not in control of these things, he really can't guarantee that he's going to bring us to heaven. But the fact that he is means that he will. And for that, we ought to give him glory. But don't forget, this only applies to those who love him. If you love the Lord, he is working these things together for your good. If you love the Lord, it will show in your life by the way you live. You will do the things pleasing to him. You will worship him. You will serve him. You will do all his will as best as you possibly can. That is what the Bible says is true of you if you've trusted Jesus. If you haven't, these promises don't apply. You need to trust the Lord before they do. So I hope that if you haven't done that, you will trust the Lord. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer. And let's ask the Lord to take what we've heard and again apply it to us as we need to hear it.